Welcome everybody to the uh, audit committee meeting of your Sioux Falls Council. Today is Thursday, January 5th, and uh, uh, thank you all for being here. We have a large agenda today, so let's get started. Um, first thing, I'd like the approval of the minutes of December 20th or 29th, uh, 2016. Could I have a motion to approve? Second. And second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, let's move right into our audit reports and updates. Uh, updates uh, from uh, our friends from I, I Bailey, uh, Mr. Severson. Say, so what happened to the good-looking guy that used to come here? <laughs> he was smart and he retired. <laughs> oh well, I'll tell you, I put him to work again already. So uh, have you? Yeah, yeah. All right. So good. we're just want to let you know he's not just sitting on his laurels. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Keith Severson, and I'm a partner with Eid Bailey, and I'm here to just share with you uh, where we're at from the audit approach for the completion of the 2016 financial statement audit for the City of Sioux Falls. Included in your packets and, and overhead are really just a, a few items that I just want to quickly walk you through. Uh, just an update on the service team, as well as our objectives, our audit approach, uh, just to give you a little heads up on a recent professional standard changes, and then uh, for your information, really uh, our approach on some of the risk assessment when we go through the audit process. I'm pleased to uh, report our service team really stays very consistent with years past. Ryan Stavinger is our, our lead audit partner. He's out of our Fargo office, uh, but he is going to again uh, be our engagement partner in managing the project, as well as Jamie Fay, who has worked with your team for the last several years. Uh, will continue as the engagement manager. We then staff it out of Sioux Falls with other staff with Elizabeth Chapman, who is new uh, on this project this year, uh, but she's going to be our financial statement in charge. And then Courtney will continue with our uh, compliance side, and then the rest kind of falls through with our, our Sioux Falls staff. But with uh, Brian and Jamie uh, really being consistent with years past, uh, we're looking forward to having that uh, assist in the process. The audit objectives clearly are uh, that we will be prepared the audit in accordance with generally accepted government auditing standards uh, to obtain a reasonable but not absolute assurance about the financial statements that they are free of a material misstatement. And we do go through a variety of procedures and they include uh, examination on a test basis, various areas in the financial statements uh, and uh, review of supporting documents which includes a lot of outside verification of information as well as discussions with management. And uh, the biggest item sometimes that we look at is really the, uh, the estimates, because they can potentially have an impact on the financial statements. And so we'll go through a five-year analysis along with some other items as it relates to the IBNR, which is the insurance claims, uh, other post-employment uh, benefit analysis uh, that we will look at as it relates to uh, really the, the city plan as well as the firefighters plan. Uh, we also obtain information from outside sources as it relates to like Burns and McDonnell on the landfill analysis uh, on what some of the costs for reclamation are out there and then uh, obviously a, a review of the pension assets and liabilities. Uh, many of that is that we're waiting for some of that actual aerial reports and so we go through that information uh, that we obtain from outside sources and how that compares with your financial statements. The next item really is, is some of the planning. And I just want to share with this group, we say up there that our planning really started in November and December, but we actually met uh, on this year's audit back in early September. One of the first things we did as a result of some of our discussions here is really we got together uh, with the finance department and really evaluated uh, the 2015 process. And so we first looked at that, a lot of the, the steps and the facts as it relates to the preparation and the ultimate issuance of the CAFR and the final financial statements and really had that discussion first to plan for, for 2016. Uh, but we did start with the planning in, in early November. We then again met again as a team uh, to talk about the entity changes in the environment, uh, various internal control changes, uh, some of the staffing changes that have taken place on the finance uh, side in reviewing uh, how that's going to impact uh, 
working with the outside auditors uh, with new staff coming in uh, scheduled to come in at the end of uh, uh, January and just kind of work through some of those steps. We then started with uh, some interim testing and have also addressed some other factors and gotten information uh, to the staff here as it relates to footnote disclosure and some other items that are changes from last year just to try to get ahead of the game and to continue to take some of that item. So we've already started some of that uh, interim process. We then look at uh, the year-end testing, which really is going to start now. Uh, our first real field work starts uh, probably that first week in, in February. And so we will have staff on site as it relates to that. Uh, obviously, we review a, a variety of items, but the bulk of that work is going to be done in early February, March. And then we are then waiting for some of those actuarial reports that typically come in April uh, to kind of work through the rest of the financial statements. And you can see up there that we are looking for an issue audit date of April 28th. That's a target. Uh, I think we've got a, a good, well laid out plan to get there. Uh, and then we can be meeting with this group, whatever your scheduled meeting would be uh, in May. But the intent is to try to get that issued uh, on or before April 28th. Just two new uh, pronouncements. Uh, there's, a, there's been a new GASB, number 72, and then 77. And both of these items really just talk about added disclosure. Uh, we've already gotten copies of those footnotes and some of the added items to uh, the team here at the, at the finance office uh, to say these are some of the new things that are gonna, we're going to need to address in this year's financial statements. And so uh, both of those new pronouncements just do have added disclosure as it relates to um, really the, uh, the measurement, uh, the fair value measurement, uh, the impact on some of the notes, as well as uh, the tax abatements. Uh, grossing some of those items up and just taking a look at, at what the disclosure items would be. So those are only the two new ones that, uh, that we really have that we haven't had in years past. The one last year was really the big pension change. Uh, this year it's these two items. The rest is just uh, for your information to, to really determine uh, what we go through as it relates to risk assessment. And a lot of that there's inherent risk, which is the successibility of assertion to a misstatement due to error or fraud that could be a material impact to the financial statements. And then we also evaluate fraud risk and the chance of actually an intentional misrepresentation or alteration of the accounting records that, uh, that are really used to make up your financial statements. So those are the two big areas that we evaluate. And from that, we then categorize each of the areas for risk assessment and the procedures that are performed in those particular areas. And so then we just break that audit down into cash, revenues, expense, payroll, inventories, uh, capital assets, long-term debt, fund balance, net positions, grants, journal entries, all of those other items. So it's all kind of started with the first two risk assessments, but then it's broken down into making sure that we address the steps in each individual area. So just wanted to share that with you and uh, walk through the real step of really that planning and what we've kind of done before to get us here where we are today to get people started on the on the field work uh, the first week in in February and then uh, shoot for an issuance date uh, of honor about April 28th okay any questions for Keith at this point I know last year there was a little hold up with a couple of areas um, I would appreciate if you'd make the committee know uh, let us know about those and same with the finance department if we can help in any way getting those in be happy to do so we will do that and uh, I think that's what we address Rex in uh, in that September meeting uh, we've already reached out to uh, the auditors for the housing authority uh, in uh, Brady Martz to get that information at, at an earlier date and so uh, we will keep you informed of the progress Good. as we proceed well in advance of April 28th there you so go. Uh, we're going to keep you uh, in tune, and I will give you updates uh, as it relates to that. Super. Okay. Super. Thank Anything you very else? Much, Keith. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Appreciate we'll it. We look forward to working with you. You bet. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Rich in, in uh, affordable housing internal control. Yeah. Uh, Kim will present the audit since she did the audit work, and then we also have the uh, affordable housing manager here uh, if there's any questions after Kim uh, makes her presentation. So. Go ahead, Kim. Hi. Um, 
This was a um, internal audit done on the internal controls in place over um, community developments affordable housing division. They provide funding for six programs that, if I, that provide assistance to low or moderate income households. Um, as you can see in the report, they're listed out and some program results from 2015 are also included. Um, the financial assistance that they provide and the deferred loans that they service are facilitated by the City of Sioux Falls Community Development Department, and that's where we focus our audit procedures. There are some additional um, single-family rehab loans that are on a monthly repayment program, um, which are serviced directly by Wells Fargo Bank. Those payments are made directly to the bank, so we just reviewed the overall um, reconciliation process for those. Um, loans are tracked in Cursor Control, which is a software specialized for community development management, and then journal entries are prepared and posted to the city's financial software. Um, most of these programs are um, federal funding, and that's drawn down through a system called um, IDIS, or Integrated Disbursement and Information System, and that's facilitated um, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, the basic objectives of the audit were to evaluate internal controls over three areas, um, the accounts payable process, the accounts receivable process, and then the drawdown process from the IDIS system. We reviewed internal controls as they were currently in place and functioning, and for sampling, we used a scope of January 1st, 2016 through June 30th. Um, we did, for accounts payable, test a sample of expenditures that would have been representative of that population um, of individual checks that were written during our audit period. What we found is that each check, each check was properly supported, um, contained proper signatures, and was made payable to both the client and the contractor or the title company. We noted proper segregation of duties and management approval in line with what we consider current leading practices. The affordable housing's current procedures already required dual signatures on checks. However, we did note that there were multiple signers on the account that were unfamiliar with the nature of the expenditures, so we did have an audit recommendation to address that and um, request that the signatories be updated. A review of accounts receivable um, included reviewing income received directly by, by affordable housing. Um, we noted proper segregation of duties in place again, um, management approval where it needed to be and it's consistent with leading current practices. The bank reconciliations are being prepared by the finance department, um, which is another good control. And we noted that um, all transactions we reviewed that were entered into cursor, cursor control also matched what was recorded in MUNIS and then subsequently drawn down through IDIS. Um, in regards to the drawdowns, um, we reviewed two months, noting proper segregation was present in that process as well. As well. Um, the same person that logs in to request the drawdown can't approve it, so HUD requires that type of segregation. And um, additionally, over the drawdown process, they are subject to external audits, not only by Ide Bailey, but also by um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, so we reviewed those audits and noted no findings specific to inter or internal controls. Very few findings that were cleared up and um, processes were changed to avoid those going forward. So everything looked good there. Um, we did make the following recommendations. Um, management did a great job documenting their current procedures in February of 2016. Um, those were the procedures that we tested over these three areas. The suggestions we're making um, were not based on anything necessarily we found. We were just trying to improve the process. Um, the current procedures did include employee names versus job titles, so we thought they should update that. And then also um, kind of beef them up to include um, a prohibition against writing checks to cash, against writing checks in advance, and then a requirement to periodically update those signatures that we talked about. Um, recommendation two, um, address the signatures that were on file. Um, we suggested to change the signers on the account. Um, the signature for the manual checks will now be the Director of Community Development, which it was, um, but the second, or sorry, the second signature will be the Director of Community Development, and then the city clerks will be removed as signatories on the accounts. And that's actually already been implemented, and we verified that. So. Um, 
a huge thanks to Les and his staff for cooperating during the audit, giving us what we need. And if you have any questions, he's here to facilitate, or I can answer what. Any questions on this audit? I have one. Uh, Kim, the, I, I noted earlier you talked about um, uh, the second signature on the checks should be somebody who knows what's going on a little bit. Right. Does the parking facility manager he's know listed, what's going on? He's listed to be a second signer in the absence of what our, the community development director or kind of an emergency yeah, situation Darren, if it I, has to get done. I wouldn't foresee that being needed very often. I guess Les could talk to that, but <clears throat> they have, um, you know, their programs and their checks that they make payable are, time is kind of of the essence, and Les can talk better to that, but you have contractors who are trying to get their subcontractors paid, and, and sometimes they need to. Appreciate the, uh, I'm Les Kinstead, I'm the affordable housing manager. I appreciate, you know, the concern that you bring up. It's a good question. Uh, Matt, you know, op operates out of this building. We operate out of the same suite. He recognizes some of the things that we're doing. We have conversations about that. And I guess in, in a combination of internal control and, like she said, getting the checks out to the contractors on a weekly basis who do work, we felt this was the best alternative. I don't think I could count on one hand uh, the number of times that or I, I could count on one hand right. the number of times that we've had Matt involved in signing any of those checks. So I think it's uh, pretty infrequent that you're gonna see that happen. We also, uh, starting uh, as soon as Tracy and his folks uh, have a chance to work with us and get this set up, we'll be doing not manual checks anymore, but electronic checks and, and through the city system. So I think that will obviate any problems that we might have in that area. So. Super. Okay, thank you, Kim. Thank you. I would, and Les, I would entertain a motion to um, approve this audit to uh, move on to the um, to the full council for approval. So moved. Okay. Second. And Jason, second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Next one is the uh, internal or adaptive signal control um, with uh, me. You. Yeah, I, I did this one. I'll take this one. Um, we considered this was in the annual audit plan, but we considered it more of an analysis and an audit because we weren't looking at uh, risk and controls or comparing actual performance to some established criteria like on a contract audit. So call it an analysis. Um, it was interesting to work with our, uh, our city traffic engineer who's in the audience here and also the city engineer in case questions come up after my presentation that I can't answer. Uh, I have a little information there in the background section on, on page two and page three of, of use of this uh, adaptive signal control technology in other cities and also um, the, our, the first use of it here in Sioux Falls. And, uh, you know, the conventional traffic signals are simply programmed that, for example, in certain street lights in Sioux Falls at 10 o'clock at night, they, they go to red flashing. And then at, I don't know, if it's 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning, whatever it is, and they go back to the, the, the pre-programmed timing. And uh, with the adaptive signal control technology, it, it's uh, much more reactive to the actual conditions. There's a, there's a camera, there's computer hardware, computer software. So the, uh, the, the, the brains of the, the technology can adjust the timing of the signals to accommodate the actual traffic that it's seeing through the camera. And so the, the benefits on page two there, uh, you know, you should see improved traffic flow. You should see faster response to traffic conditions. For example, if there's a train on 26th Street and uh, the traffic can't go east-west, but it can go north-south, it will know that and adjust the signals accordingly. Um, it should cut costs because uh, uh, commuters shouldn't have as much idling time. They should save a little bit on gas. Kinder to the environment for the same reason there's less uh, idling time of, of vehicles. Now, <clears throat> on the bottom of page two, I, I want to point out it's not a cure-all for if, if, the, if the corridor is simply oversaturated. I mean, it's not a cure-all. Um, people might expect, well, once they get the technology, it'll be green light all the way. Every time I go down that corridor, that's, that, it's, that, that would be exceeding the, uh, uh, what, what the system can do. But certainly there should be some measurable uh, benefits that we can, that we can notice. Uh, so, so far, it's just the East 26th Street corridor from about uh, um, 
I believe it's, uh, well, just uh, east of Cliff Avenue where it starts, that first signal, and then all the way to uh, Veterans Highway there, Highway 100. So there's about 10 intersections that have lights. And that's a very heavily traveled corridor. And I think it was picked because um, I, I, I believe he told me that they get a lot of complaints about that corridor. And um, now in 2017, the contracts have been signed with, uh, with Rhythm Engineering. It's a joint project with the city and the state DOT. Uh, Minnesota Avenue from 18th Street to 229 is gonna have the technology and the city will pay for that portion. And then 41st Street from Norton Avenue to Marion Road will have the, uh, the technology and the state DOT will, will fund that, but it, it's basically one contract or one contract. Um, the Minnesota equipment should be operational by May of this year. 41st Street should be a month later in June of 2017. That's the anticipated uh, when, when the, op the equipment will be operational. So um, lessons learned, page three, um, had some challenges when they were installing it uh, th um, three years ago in January 2014. City crews were used at that time. Um, for Minnesota and 41st Street, they are gonna use a, a contractor. I think Action Electric will be the contractor, but for the first time, the uh, traffic engineers wanted the, the crews to be very familiar with the nuts and bolts, so they actually did the installation, and there were some challenges with the weather, but they got through those. Another thing uh, that, that um, the traffic engineer will get a, a, a question about, if there's an accident, um, a citizen might call and say, can we get video of that accident? Because uh, I know you got cameras on 26th Street, and the, the answer is no, the, the, the images are not stored because it's not necessary for the operation of the technology. And the other thing is it required, that would require a lot of server space, so there's a cost issue there. So no, the video is not stored. Um, so people, uh, when they ask for video of their accident, we, we can't provide that, so. Um, as far as what we did for, for the analysis, we, we basically looked at what, what our traffic engineer had, had done for looking at the safety, looking at the uh, uh, traffic delays, got down to the, 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 the nuts and bolts of the data, uh, and also talked to him a lot about the methodology used for the analysis. We, we found the methodology to be sound. Um, had a very, very, very few, couple of minor tweaks on the, on the numbers, but nothing significant. Um, one thing that was surprising, on, on page five there, we, we looked at the travel time, the number of traffic stops, a number of delays. Um, everything showed an improvement after installation, except for that eastbound four to six p.m., that, that peak period eastbound, in, you know, in the afternoon, that kind of the drive time there, um, that that got worse, and so we're a little perplexed about it. Uh, talking to the traffic engineer, I, I, I think what happened was the the, the, the most probable reason is that um, before the the uh, technology was installed, the um, the the uh, the timing of the lights was heavily skewed to favor eastbound traffic at the expense of, say, Bonson Avenue or or Southeastern. So once you put that technology in, it's working as it's supposed to. Uh, you know, it appears to be really worse for the eastbound, but um, so th that seemed to be the explanation of it. So um, now the, the, the issue they had was when trying to figure out, uh, you know, get some, get some data on, on travel time and delays and, and so off and so forth, they had to have their, uh, their staff actually drive the route with GPS technology. Um, they didn't have a good way to do it, so uh, somebody, a city employee in a car would have to drive the route and then it would, the GPS would know exactly when they got to a specific intersection and, and the technology, the computer uh, program could determine, well, how much of a delay there was and et cetera, et cetera. So they did that before the installation, they did that after the installation, and we looked at all that raw data. Uh, now with the, um, they won't have to do that necessarily on 41st and Minnesota when, when that technology is installed this year because uh, the computer software will, will do that in real time. Analysis will be done uh, continually, so they would not necessarily have to do that, um, you know, because uh, that, that does take a lot of bit of time. That takes quite a bit of time, a staff time to do that. So um, it just was a case for 26th Street. They didn't have that uh, t technology to, to do that analysis when they had it installed. So uh, now if we look at the safety, starting at the bottom of page five, uh, we looked at the number of accidents. Uh, they, they got the information from the police department. And uh, after in, since the installation, there was a 21% reduction in crashes. And then we also looked at societal costs. Societal costs are calculated by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, everything from property damage to lost earnings to medical costs, et cetera, et cetera, all the bullet points there in the report. 
And uh, we came up with um, uh, the, that the societal costs have decreased $891 per day just because of reduced crashes. Um, before the installation of the equipment, you had, a, uh, you had an accident about, uh, I think, 0.32, so about every three days you'd have an accident. After the installation, it was about, one, about once every four days, about 0.25. So the number of crashes, and we're usually talking about rear end collisions typically. And so um, if, if you come up with that number of $891 daily and we spent $371,000 of taxpayer money, within a little over a year, you've basically recouped that cost because um, you know, you've had less crashes. And, and uh, so that's, that's very much a plus. So, uh, the results so far, you know, preliminary on just one corridor are very promising. Um, we can expect the traffic congestion to improve on 41st and also on Minnesota once the technology is installed. Um, we should have better safety. We should have fewer rear end collisions based on what we saw and then also what we've seen in other cities. Uh, and I have that information on page two of what other cities have experienced. So um, the, uh, you, know, you know, it isn't like, when, once the installation of the, the equipment isn't, it, it won't be necessarily that you can start on 18th in Minnesota and go green light all the way to the interstate necessarily. We don't want to give people the expectation that you can go all the way from, you know, <laughs> sea to shining sea, so to speak, without hitting a, hitting a light. But it should, it should be improving. Uh, so um, if you have any questions, uh, we have a traffic engineer here and uh, otherwise. Any questions? Yes, great. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Nicer. I have a, a handful of questions, I guess, and whether Rich or the traffic engineers can help me. Um, this is very interesting. Uh, so today, I believe when there needs to be a change, I might see Heath out there playing in the box and making a change to the timing. It, in, in this case, is it something where you install it and then the computer is smart enough to just make the changes on the fly and then you don't, your hands off from, from forevermore, or what, what's your role with adaptive signals? Um, Heath Hopti is our principal traffic engineer for the city of Sioux Falls. Um, <clears throat> we won't, um, we don't have to interfere nearly as much in the programming of the intersections once the system's in place. It's a, a lot of the variations and things that happen on a, happen on a corridor, the system can actually handle itself this is what we're finding on 26th Street. Um, there's still there's still some programming that's involved with it. Still things we have to do with the controller, but it's not near as much. It's uh, a corridor that has the adaptive um, signal pro or the adaptive system in it. We don't have to do as much corridor retiming as we do on a as um, you know like the 41st Street and Minnesota Avenue pro corridors, and that'll be huge for for us. Um, this coming year, once we get Minnesota Avenue and 41st Street corridors, get the systems in place on those, that's going to free up a lot of time for us for working on Cliff Avenue and East 10th Street and a couple of other corridors that need a lot of work with just raw programming. Okay. Uh, do Is there any data that this would improve traffic enough that it would help to defer possibly build out of new lanes at least temporarily um that that's this is um where basically the idea the concepts a lot of it for the adaptive signal control technology for us it got started in the everyday counts initiative from federal highway a number of years back where they started pushing <laughs> us to look at a lot of innovations to put out into the streets and um through the everyday counts, it had a lot to do with exactly that, where they were looking at corridors where, can we get this out into corridors where maybe you don't need six lanes once you get a system like this in place, or you can hold off improvements for a long time. Um, East 26th Street as held, held out as an example. That was a corridor where we were, and we still have some pretty significant capacity issues on the corridor, but having the system in place through the interchange area through Southeastern has really helped us out in our capacity needs to get us to 2019 when we're going to be rebuilding that area. And if, if you'll indulge me a few more. Okay. So why uh, so why <laughs> less rear ends? Is there less red lights that, that people encounter, it, it, less stop and goes? Or? Yep, it's, um, the system has overall the reduction of red light or the reduction of stops on the main line. 
it's um, I think it's in here. It was like a 20% reduction in stops that we saw on the main line, and the reduction in stops basically translates directly into a reduction in rear ends from people just not running into each other. And then one thing about the the adaptive signal programming is that the the system, the way it tries to flow traffic through the corridors, it tries to hold traffic together into the tunnels is what it, that it's called, and it. Basically, it's got the cars platooned together instead of having kind of, what I want to say, it's traffic stretched out and in different areas. It tries to keep the traffic more together while it's going through the corridor. And having the traffic together leads to a steadier flow and then possibly bigger gaps on like the non signalized intersections for traffic to pull out in between cars. So, and then finally, the ones that aren't, um, that don't have this, are, are they essentially? Um, have the same timing all day long, 24-7? Or, or, or could you have the power to, like on my TLS road and 26th yeah. Street, can you tell it at certain peak times in the morning to cycle every 30 seconds? And I mean, yep. what's the difference? Yep, like um, 26th and Ellis Road, it's there, the, um, the max times, and it's a, that's a, since we put in the actuation at that intersection, it's got vehicle detectors, so it doesn't run a set time every time, but it has a set maximum it can run. Oh. And it's got the maximums changed by time of day at that intersection, so that in the morning, in the evenings, Ellis Road had, can have more green time than it can have during like three in the afternoon. And um, a corridor like West 12th Street, for example, along that corridor, we've got eight signal timing plans that run various times of the day that um, depending on the different traffic flows that are occurring. And um, on average, an intersection in the city of Sioux Falls has at least three timing plans, if not more, depending on the traffic flows that we see throughout the day. But the, the big thing is like West 12th Street, to develop eight timing plans for that corridor, which works fairly well out there, takes a lot of time to develop eight timing plans. And where the adaptive system, with that in place, you get what I want to say, better flow for all your time periods without having to create lots and lots of timing plans. I assume there's a lot of trial and error. You go out, yep. you tweak it a little bit, and then you have to wait and see how it works, and then you might have to tweak it again, and it's kind of a yep. iterative and, Yep, and deal. a lot of times if you try a new timing plan, you can't, you can't change it quickly. Or you, once you make the change, you have to let it go for at least a week or two usually to see what traffic really does with it. So okay. it's an iterative process. To and it, it, one more. Um, yep. So I, in, in Rich talked about this. The installation was done by the city the first time around. I don't have a problem with the contractor doing it this time, but mm -hmm. what, was it a matter of just because you wanted to learn the first time around, or were there lessons learned that it was just a pain and that it was just easier to go with the contractor this time? It or? was um, a couple things that we identified through that. It was we, we really wanted the guys to get a chance to um, get their hands on the equipment, the installation of it, so they, they know exactly what went into it, how the cabling works, how the equipment's set up, and everything about it. But then um, one of the biggest things that we run into is our guys have to do all the maintenance through the, for the traffic system throughout the entire city. So what we ran into was when we were trying to do the installs, we would start work in the morning and be pulling cables, but then you know, we'd have a signal go out or something went into flash. And so after, after working for like an hour and a half, the crews would usually have to pull off and do something else and then come back. And it was really, it was really not something, it, it's something that really lends itself to crews that can come in and work for a full day pulling cables. And that really isn't the case for our crews. With okay, the, thank you. The works they have to do, so. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, Councilor Kiley. Uh, Heath, uh, 75 trips were done before installation, 93 trips were done after installation to test the process. Um, is it safe to assume that the variables were pretty similar before and after? In other words, you didn't have a closure on 57th Street or 18th Street yeah. that shifted more traffic to 26th? Yep, it was um, basically we tried to do it through time periods that had very similar things going on throughout that and the entire east side of the city. Um, we even switched up. We had, there was four of us that did the driving at various different times. So we had different, we went through the entire day from 
it's, I think the earliest run we did was at about 7.05 in the morning through about 5.50 or so into the evening, just the various different times to get the different time periods using different drivers so that we had different driving styles driving through the corridor too, just to get as many various data points as we could to try to make it as fair as possible to judge the before and after. Okay. Yeah, and the results are interesting. It is interesting that between 4 and 6 p.m., that mm -hmm. you were seeing increases on the eastbound traffic, and my my wife would probably <laughs> be upset with that, but I am traveling south on southeastern, so that's kind of a wash. Well, and um, the, the one You're thing more about it, too. With me before dealing with her. In, in our data, we included all our after runs that we've done in, in this, too, and we've done a lot of work on trying to, um, what I want to say, fix that up to try to reduce that. and. You know, some, some of our later runs show maybe closer to it being less of an increase in eastbound um, travel time, but generally overall, what we've seen is the, the improvement at Southeastern and at the ramps and at Bonson for the queues and how then the types of delays that traffic had, it, those improved so much that it's, I, I think that overall it's a huge benefit even during that time period, so. Does the, um, the the train going through the area, how does that interact with this system? Um, well, the system recognizes that there's a train and it, impl it implements the preemption program at the intersection, which basically um, gives traffic north-south the green and then it can allow the westbound left to make, a, make that movement too. So it, it's running through those. And then once it exits the, the train motor, you know, once the train gets through, it's um, the older system, or you know, basically the regular timings, it just had our preemption programming that went back to its normal timing. And it just kind of tried to, what do I say, just try to try to get back into sync. And it would usually take seven minutes or so, sometimes, sometimes close to 15 minutes to clear the traffic after a train to really get things back to normal. What we're finding with the adaptive system in place is that um, it's keeping track of how many cars are on the approaches and how long they've been waiting. So after a train comes through, it sees like the westbound cars on the east side of Southeastern and it's, it's and it's, um, when I say the calculations it's doing, it's looking at those and saying, well, those guys have been waiting six minutes. So it gets them flushed out a lot quicker than it used to with the tr traditional programming following a train, so. I think I experienced that when I was southbound on, or northbound on Southeastern after the train and uh, when the train was gone, uh, the eastbound traffic started to flow again, and then it eventually switched to the north and south, but mm -hmm. it was about a six second green light. Yep. And so <laughs> I, I was victimized in that situation, but anyway, it, it seemed to be moving that uh, east-westbound traffic quite efficiently. I know it feels like that for me too, like they got a sensor in your car and, and Heath is watching you <laughs> and making every red light happen as you go. I, Sometimes I accuse you of that, going down the road. Yes? I, just being a techie, I, I guess I have one more question. So what is it counting? I mean, is it actually visually counting cars? Is it so, at, what's it, what is it doing? What we have, um, it's, we've got, or you know, it's got its image that it looks at. And what we do is we set up that image, we can set up detector zones on that image. And then once we get that in, we're, we're looking at cars going through that intersection, through that image, and we're um, basically splitting up the detection zone into zones that are car size zones. So it's got the big detection zone it's looking at to know that there's vehicles there. But then it's also, we have it broke up into these little, I want to say little infinitesimal little boxes we have it broke down into so that it can track the cars as they're going through the intersection. And then it can count up how many are queued up too, so it knows, or you know. So basically, it's you know a rectangle on a rectangle on the screen that's split up into little horizontal lines, and then each box that's filled in, it's registering in its mind as this is a vehicle waiting in this box. So okay. it's not it's not perfect. It can't count perfectly, but it's a basically taking the visual representation we've seen on the screen and trying to figure out the best way to translate it into the computer as to how many vehicles are on that approach. Councilor Kiley again. One follow-up question. Um, does it have the capability of detecting pedestrians crossing intersections it, or are we just creating faster 
pedestrians. <laughs> now, um, it, it's there's pedestrian there's pedestrian push buttons at all the intersections. So you, the pedestrians at this point still have to push the button to put the call in. Um, the system it actually has a module in it that's built for looking at letting it know when the pedestrians are act activated and um, getting the pedestrian call put into the system. Um, we have, we've had some complaints, and I, can't, I think it might have been mentioned in the audit report at um, 26th and Van Epps and at 26th and Bonson about having to um, wait for long periods of time before after pushing the button. But the one thing about the system, we're able, it records when the button was pushed and it records when the pedestrian time or when the pedestrian time was given for the light too. So we're able to record exactly how long of a delay they had after pushing the button until they got their pedestrian light. And on average, it's probably about 30 seconds from what we're seeing throughout the system. And the, um, the situations where we had the complaints of the delays on Van Epps and Bonson, when we went through the data, we were finding that in our extreme cases, it was probably close to 50 to 60 seconds of a wait, which, um, you know, with the older system, it was possible when we were running the 146 second cycle in the periods that if you push the button at the wrong time, you might wait two minutes before you got your pedestrian light, so. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, this is a report, so we will, uh, we will accept the report and, uh, and thank you very much, Heath and Rich for a good report. No, I don't, it's a report, so. It's not an audit, so we, we just will accept it. Okay. Um, correct, yeah. clerk? It's a report. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's move on in the citywide cash audit. Yes. Um, as part of our process of developing our annual audit plan, we always ask for input from the city directors, and we also ask from elected officials, the mayor and the council. And this was asked um, of an internal audit to do a uh, survey. Oh, excuse me. As part of our annual audit process, we asked for input from elected officials and directors, and the mayor had asked for this last fall, when uh, fall of 2015, when we're getting the 2016 plan ready to go. So uh, we had done, uh, you know, this is kind of my one of my last audits, and one of my very first audits in 2007 was kind of the same thing. We looked at all the city departments, kind of a high-level review of the cash handling. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> we uh, first helped. First of all, how to define cash. We define it as coin, currency, checks, and then payment cards, you know, credit cards or debit cards. <clears throat> and then we intend it to go around to each department. You know, we start with finance because finance is responsible overall for the cash collected by the city. And we ended it with finance, but in between, in between there, we went to the various city departments that collect cash. And uh, we, we developed a questionnaire that we had the departments fill out. And then when we would sit down at our entrance meeting with each department, we'd go through the questionnaire. And we wanted to also know, like, uh, what, how much cash do you receive, and in what form is that? You know, how much is checks, and how much is currency, and and so forth. And uh, that kind of gave us a, a little better risk assessment as well. Um, we noted that um, as of uh, August of this year, of 2016, we had 19 petty cash funds totaling about $2,500, and we had 38 change funds totaling about 13,000. And then uh, we also listed in the appendix of the report, uh, per the mayor's instructions, he wanted to know, like, what are the city checking accounts? So that's on page 10, the very last page there, listed the, uh, the city checking accounts and who the signers are and who reconciles and, and, and so forth. Um, we have uh, some background information about, you know, how cash can be put at risk. Um, I'm not going to go through that unless you have specific questions. And then uh, what are the typical controls you would expect to see? and what are the limitations of, of controls. And then we also, uh, one thing that we did add to this because um, we're, we're getting more and more payment cards in, instead of currency or checks is, is um, something called the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. And that's kind of a hot topic with auditors now. They're looking at their organizations to see that their organization is complying with what, what's called the PCI DSS. And uh, there's information there on page four about that. Um, we did include information in case the council member would ask, well, how much do we, how much is the city paying for credit card fees? And the answer is uh, in 2015, it was about 264,000. And that represents about 2.2% of each transaction. 
so there's there's a cost to accepting payment cards, but on the other hand, you know you're not going to have a bad check, and they're, they're they're more efficient. People expect to pay with payment cards now, um, so we're, it's part part of its customer service. So the objectives were on the bottom of page four. There, uh, we want to look at um, the status of audit recommendations from prior cash handling audits over the years, and uh, also determine if the Departments had up-to-date written policies and procedures specific to their area. Number three, determine if they had segregation of duties that was adequate to uh, safeguard the asset. That, that's a, a key control, segregation of duties. Number four, we want to make sure that deposits are made timely, that we didn't have departments that were sort of sitting on the, on the, the, the cash and sitting on it for a few weeks before they got around to uh, putting it in the bank or something like that. And we want to look at the, um, the physical security of the cash uh, to make sure that somebody, you know, it won't be easy to steal the change fund or, or, the, or the cash that was received during the day. You know, are, are we locking it up? Where are we locking it up? That sort of thing. And then finally, number six for the objective was to determine the level of compliance with that payment card industry um, security standard. As I said, we did, uh, came up with a cash handling questionnaire and we met with all the departments. We would sit down a lot of times with the frontline staff that handle the cash, uh, see what they do, uh, you know, take a look at the physical security, uh, do a lot of research into that. Uh, what are the requirements of that PCI DSS? I did talk to the, uh, the director of audit services for the city of Portland because they had just done uh, uh, an audit specifically of the, the, the credit card standards, and he had presented at an auditor conference that he attended uh, about a year and a half ago. So. Uh, got him on the phone, uh, got a lot of good information from him, you know, questions to ask, see if they're doing this, see if they're doing that. And then we also looked at some general le ledger records, kind of verifying if the deposits are made timely. Um, bottom of page five, noteworthy accomplishments. Um, we have noticed over the 10 years that we've, we've been around as an internal audit department and done these cash audits, uh, the uh, improved segregation of duties, which is good. Uh, elimination of, of some petty cash funds, and when I was talking to finance at the end of this audit, um, I think the goal is to eliminate petty cash almost entirely. Uh, there really isn't a, a great need for it. Uh, there, there's something called a P card, a procurement card, for, for small dollar purchases. So the intent is to just kind of phase, continue to phase out the, the petty cash. Now the change fund's a different thing. We still have to have change funds. Uh, people still pay with currency. Um, two departments have instituted unannounced cash counts by supervisors, uh, the police department and the uh, health department. And then a, and a big, uh, a big noteworthy accomplishment is assignment of business analysts from the finance office to specific city departments. And so they're in a great position to monitor actual revenue and expenses against anticipated revenue expenses as part of their duties. And the benefit is that problems can be detected earlier. Yeah, you know, if there's an issue that something doesn't look right, there's an analyst in the finance department that's looking at that specific department. So uh, we want to point that out. Uh, as far as results on page six there, um, all the prior audit recommendations have been implemented uh, in regarding uh, cash handling. Uh, all the departments had written policies and procedures for the most part, uh, with one exception, and there they are in the process of uh, uh, developing those procedures. Segregation of duties, uh, it, it appeared to us that there was adequate segregation of duties. No one employee can do all the steps necessary to receive and process cash payments. And uh, timeliness of deposits, uh, with a couple of exceptions I'll explain, uh, the cash received by almost all city offices is deposited into the city's bank account within two business days of receiving it. Uh, the exceptions were just the cash from the rural, rural libraries. There isn't much cash in those rural libraries um, so that might be deposited about every two weeks or monthly, depending on the volume. And then the, the money from the parking meters, that, that's collected by the, uh, I, I believe it's the Sioux Merchant Patrol, and that's not necessarily daily. Um, it's, it's, you know, uh, depending on the route that they, they go, it might be once a week or it might be a couple times a week that they collect the money from the, uh, the parking meters. But it's not, a, you know, obviously a huge amount of money. Uh, so that uh, we're satisfied with the timeliness of deposits. Physical security, um, there is adequate physical security in our opinion. It, it varies with the, the risk involved with the amount of cash. Uh, so some departments have quite a bit of physical security with you know, plexiglass and alarms and that sort of thing just because they have a lot of cash. And then others, it's simply um, a small amount of cash. They lock it up in a, in a, in a 
you know, a strong box or, or a, a, an appropriate place like that. So we didn't have any issues there. And uh, our risk manager does do, uh, um, uh, from time to do, time to time do safety reviews of city departments and they make rec various recommendations uh, if they see something that they don't like. That six audit objective, the, the payment card industry uh, data security standard, what you don't want to see is that we're collecting credit card information and storing it on the city servers and we don't do that. We always go through a third party vendor and the third party vendors have to have a, a, a compliance review done by an outside uh, entity. Um, and we actually looked at some of the reports that, you know, that we could get from, uh, for, uh, that the third parties had, had gone through a compliance report. So um, the other thing is you want to make sure that the employees, want, if they receive credit card information, that they aren't writing it down because the, the question is, what do you do with that piece of paper? You know, if you wrote somebody's credit card information down. Uh, there's just one department that I was aware of that would receive maybe a credit card information occasionally through the mail on like an application. And that employee simply, you know, keys it in, they, they log on to that third party, uh, you know, s software. They're not on the city computer. They enter the information and then they immediately shred the information. Uh, occasionally, employees might take it over the phone um, and then simply are keying it in immediately. They're not writing it down on a piece of paper. And, um, and we don't record the phone calls because that's another issue. If you're recording phone calls and, and you've got credit card information on the recording, that's a violation too. And we don't, we don't do that. So we didn't see any issues with, um, with that payment card uh, data security standards. So, um, other observations, top of page seven, uh, we became aware that there was an outside agency that by contract receives payments for fees on behalf of the city. They have not been audited yet, so we will likely recommend that goes on the annual audit plan for 2017 to, uh, to look at that. And we discussed that situation with management, so they were in agreement with that. Um, we did determine that, uh, with the exception of the, of the swimming pool uh, cashiers, uh, the employees normally don't get a formal uh, training on cash handling, so we recommend that that, that that be done. And that was our first recommendation there. And then we also noted during the audit that many of the payments the city receives are in the form of currency and checks, and we'd like to see more of those uh, payments uh, be done through uh, ACH, the automatic clearinghouse system that's more safe, it's more efficient. Um, the, the ACH, ACH transactions are done bank to bank. And uh, the city is already using a lot of ACH for both payments received and payments made, but we'd just like to see that trend continued. So that was our second recommendation. Uh, the finance director responded. They, they concur with those recommendations. And um, just on that uh, appendix one there on page nine, that was just a list of the areas we've done over the last 10 years. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned, the, the last page or page 10 was simply a list of the checking accounts and who can sign and who reconciles. And that was something the mayor wanted to, wanted to see. So um, if there's any questions, uh, Tracy Turbeck is here from finance or, or I can attempt to answer your question. Uh, Mr. Kiley, I looked that way. Um, one question and, and whether it's Rich or, or Tracy, I'll leave it up to you guys. Um, under the recommendations, it, it says, states that training could be modified for those employees in frequently handling cash compared to employee free, employees frequently uh, handling cash. Is that design, is, is the thought there to have more frequent in-service sessions for the individual that's not doing it? Because well, if you don't use the skill, you lose the skill, or what's the thought? I, I, there, there's a, there's a, a, an occasional department, they, they might get a, a, a couple of checks a year, you know, or just a couple of checks a month. They really don't get a lot of currency. Um, it's just so infrequent that, you know, do you really need to give them training on, on the, the kind of training for somebody that's handling cash every single day? Um, we kind of left that up to the management, how they want to approach that, how often they think the training should be held and if they should modify the training. We did give an example from, uh, I think, Maricopa County, Arizona. Uh, they had a kind of a training that they do for their county employees. It actually uses a, U a YouTube video, and it was uh, kind of interesting to watch that. And um, uh, so we kind of left that up to management. Um, the pool cashiers get the training because a lot of times they, the, the employees only do it for one season and then they're gone, so they, they give them that training, sure. you know, in May before the pool's open. They give them, you know, how to operate a cash register and all that sort of thing. So okay. does that, that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank okay. you, Rich. All right. 
Councilor Knight, sir. I have uh, three questions. The first, the PCI DSS, I'll have to go read about that. That's right up my alley. I'd like to know about the encryption that is required. But um, so the, um, the, the independent vendors, they don't just get to assert, hey, we're compliant with this. They have some sort of, yeah. they have to do some sort of verification. Yeah, they have to have an independent verification. I was actually, um, for example, we use various vendors uh, for the parking uh, department. They use, I think it's called T2 is the software. So we, I had the uh, parking manager get me a, a copy of that compliance report for T2 that, and um, it was a recent report and they, and it's like, um, like a four or five page report that says, yeah, they are compliant. Um, and so they have to use some independent, I don't know who, who does that service for them, but yeah, they have to, they're supposed to be getting verified that they're protecting the information correctly, so. Okay, and then physical checks. Uh, so when you, when they get a physical check, do they, you know, scan it and because uh, these days you don't you know go back to the banks. Do they just keep them and then destroy them? What what happens to a physical check? Physical checks normally go to First Premier, the bank account that we have, our main account. They they physically. I I, I sat down in finance and a lot a lot of the uh, some of the departments it goes directly to First Premier it goes into the night drop. <coughs> For example, the park department, the uh, community centers, it goes immediately into the night drop. Uh, you know. Um, for the departments that are in City Hall or close to City Hall, like the Park Office and a couple of others, they'll actually come up to finance, and then they, they, they get the bag of, of currency and checks, and then they'll uh, verify that, and then the, the uh, Sioux Merchant Patrol will come and actually take the physical checks and the currency to First Premier every day. So, okay, yeah. so there, yeah. we, don't, we, don't keep, we don't have piles of checks sitting around here. No, no, they, they no. Go to the bank I didn't, I didn't see any of that. that we didn't see, I didn't see any yeah, piles yeah. of checks sitting around that have been scanned and then they just kind of sit around. No, they actually, the ones I saw, they all end up in the bank. Sure, okay. okay. And then the last thing was um, with, I assume we have multiple different vendors around the city because you may have one vendor, pr pr presumably maybe, when I go to the pool or I buy my pool pass, the water department might have a different vendor. It, I don't know if this is out of the scope of, of the audit, but has there been any thought, do you know, of, of um, maybe consolidating and having a one-stop shop to make all of all different payments and to have one processor for all the different departments? Uh, I, I'll, I'll let Tracy <laughs> take that whether, whether it be money saving or just logistics of not having 12 different vendors for different things. Yeah, Tracy Turback with the finance office. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly what, uh, where we're headed is to consolidate or eliminate the <coughs> multiple vendors for credit card processing or electronic transaction processing. So uh, you may have seen recently on the council list of contracts that, that a contract was approved uh, with a new company uh, that will help us get further down the road to where, where we've got, regardless of the software system, whether you're paying a park and rec fee or a utility bill or something like that, the idea is to get them all processing through the same entity. It may, it may take a while to get, get to where we've got them all going through one, but we can certainly <coughs> eliminate uh, the number or short, shorten the list of vendors. Would you know, and that's good, is there, would you know if there's a long-range goal where I might have a one-stop shop where I can go online to one place on the city website and do a drop-down, pay a parking, you know, a parking fee or pay my water bill or... Absolutely, and the, the more we can, can drive customers to pay online, uh, the better. And, and I, you know, <coughs> the key, of course... Uh, Rich mentioned the, the cost of credit card transactions. That is, there is a cost associated with that. So we will continue to push ACH transaction processing because that is uh, least expensive from the city standpoint. Uh, certainly a very safe process, but yeah, the, that's absolutely a goal to do, do more and more of that to where we, we have less manual handling and processing of any of that transaction. Do we, do we charge, you know, like if, if I pay my car tabs, I got to pay a convenience fee for using a credit card. Does the city charge a convenience fee for credit cards? Mm -hmm. Or should we? To recover that, that percentage? You know, the well, one of the reasons we've avoided doing that is because we do want to encourage people to utilize that as a method of payment versus writing a check. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in our discussions on it, it's, it's seen as almost punitive. Uh, to, to charge an additional fee for somebody to use an electronic form of payment uh, rather than incentivizing them to do that. So I think there are some places that do that. Uh, we just recognize it as a cost of doing business to, to process those, that, that the benefits do outweigh the, the cost. Okay, fair enough. Other questions? 
Uh, Mr. Martin. I just had one, one quick one. On the, on the credit card, the, the third party vendor, that they, they have to go through their own compliance. Uh, do we do anything to verify that they have done that? That well, we talked about with finance. Um, I don't think we have a formal process for that. We didn't make it a, a formal recommendation. Uh, we just simply had discussion with it. Um, I don't, I'm not aware that we have somebody tasked to do that every year on a specific vendor. Um, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, Tracy will correct me, but um, we, we, we briefly discussed it, but we didn't pursue it any further than that. So I guess the answer is no, I don't think we have anybody assigned to make sure that. But when I did ask for it, uh, certainly when I asked uh, the parking manager, he, he got it within a, a few hours. He could, he found that, and so. Uh, okay. um, notice that um, the library deposits made are made monthly or semi-monthly. Is there an increase in overdraft um, or bad checks uh, when you hold them that long? Um, I'm not aware that there is. I think it's just such a small volume in those county libraries. They hardly get, they really don't get a lot of revenue. Still getting them on counter checks too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, I don't yeah. think there's, Okay. Uh, I, I'm not aware that there, we've had a big issue with bad checks or okay. anything like that, so. Mr. Kiley? No. You're done? Nothing. Okay, this is one that we need to um, have a uh, vote on. I would entertain a motion to accept the uh, accept this report and pass it on to the full council for for their approval so moved by martins and i'll second that seconds all in favor aye aye opposed motion carries um internal audit annual report yeah um just a lot of things that we don't really change much from year to year the you know our mission vision goals and objectives um Etc. And then we just list our staff and, and uh, uh, professional credentials, et cetera, and the organizations we belong to there on page page three. Um, mentioned the audit committee there, starting at the bottom of page three and going up to page four. We just listed all the, the members here and what their terms are in case you know somebody were ever interested in well, who's on the audit committee, what's their term. So we put that information in there. Um, we just give the audit committee, you know, we just kind of report. Okay, here's what was in the plan. Um, we've got everything done except for, with the exceptions there on uh, bottom of page four. Uh, we did have that special request there, you can see that, that um, special request in 2016, we got that done, that Sioux Falls Development Foundation. And then uh, on the top of page five there, we had uh, some audits that were approved and started in prior years, and then we completed them this year. For example, the storm drainage, uh, citywide accounts receivable, landfill cash, and construction. So we got a lot of things done, still have a few things uh, to carry forward to next year. Um, I came up with a number of 17 audit recommendations made in 2016, um, and we didn't have any pushback on those. We usually don't get a lot of pushback. Once in a while, we'll, we'll get pushback on a, on a particular audit recommendation. Um, and we do uh, track that, which is the subject of the next report that, that's on the agenda. So we, uh, um, I'd like to draw your attention to the ongoing audit activities there on, on, on page five there. I just said we, we do some ongoing things that, that I look at, uh, payroll and accounts payable, et cetera. So on the very last page there, um, accounts payable, I looked at uh, with, uh, with the help of uh, our budget analyst, uh, uh, David Bixler, he's, he's very good on the uh, data analytics. We looked at um, Looking to see if we had any vendors that we made a duplicate payment. We looked at January through September 2016, um, and we didn't notice any that uh, appeared to be a duplicate. For example, you know, like the same invoice number, the same amount, that sort of thing. Excel is really good at crunching that those numbers, so we didn't notice anything that we had a duplicate payment to a vendor. And then there's something called Benford's Law, which I um, I have information if you're interested, but it, it's kind of a, a kind of a, a geeky type of thing. But it's it's a it's a tool that auditors can use and and others to look at large data sets to see if the numbers look like they've been manipulated. Um, it has to do with the first digit of a number, and uh, I won't go into detail because it's kind of it's kind of uh, it's kind of technical. It's scary. It's scary. But if you're interested, I got a piece of paper. I'll, I'll explain it to you. But um, also I looked at uh, the uh, accounts pay payable invoices. We looked at uh, September through December with the help of uh, Mr. Bixler. We didn't notice any unusual patterns. We, we found the, 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 
the, the expected pattern is what we were seeing for that first digit. For example, if accounts payable, the, if the number was, uh, you know, $5,025, that five is the first digit, and you should expect to see that five um, in a large data set occur 7.9% uh, of the time. And you should expect to see a one 30% of the time. You would think it would be, you know, the same, but it's not. And, and it's, it has to do with uh, naturally occurring numbers. And it was discovered back in the 1930s. So we look for that expected pattern. If we don't see the expected pattern, if we see one digit is like way off, then we start looking further. It could be inefficiencies. It could be something strange going on. But we didn't notice anything there. So uh, as far as payroll, I did four different things. We looked at two or more direct pays going into one a bank account. That, that's something auditors, uh, when they're looking for to see if somebody has put a ghost on the payroll, a ghost is either a real person who's not an employee and should not be on the payroll, or it could be a fictitious person and, and it's used to uh, misappropriate money. Um, now, there's a legitimate situation. We have a married couple working for the city. They have the same bank account. You're going to see the two direct deposits going in there. So we ran all the employees. Um, as of, We looked at the payroll of uh, August 11th. We noted no situations that, that we thought were suspicious. Anything that we saw was explainable as you know, a married couple working for the city. Um, we did look at, I did run the, uh, the Social Security numbers uh, for December 2016 for all the active full-time and temporary employees. Uh, we didn't notice any that were missing. That, that would be indication perhaps of a ghost employee that you, you, know, you wouldn't assign, you wouldn't, if you put it, somehow figure out a way to put a ghost on the payroll, you wouldn't give them a social security number. So we didn't notice any um, employees without a, a social security number. And then when we also looked at that list to see if there was any what they call impossible numbers, um, numbers that are never issued by the Social Security Administration. For example, there's no numbers that start out 000 that have ever been issued. So we looked through that list and we went through it with uh, the, the HR department. Um, we didn't see anything that, that looked, uh, that aroused our suspicions, that, uh, so that looked fine. Um, and then we looked at, uh, at the, uh, the HR director had asked me to look at um, his proper deductions for employees on the South Dakota retirement system. We switched all the employees that were hired on or after July 1st, 2013 to the South Dakota retirement system. So we wanted to make sure that they were all coded correctly, that they're all coded as South Dakota retirement and not the city pension system and the, and the right percentage is being taken out. And uh, we, we found that they were all uh, correct. And we discussed that also with the HR director. Um, the, uh, it, was, it was quite interesting to see that about 25% of our employees right now are on the South Dakota retirement, meaning they've been with the city for less than four years. So uh, quite a bit of turnover since, uh, since July uh, 2013, a lot of employees left. Um, as far as purchasing and procurement, we looked at, um, reviewed 29 requisitions from 2015 and 2016 to find out if they were properly processed according to policy. We didn't have any discrepancies there. And then I, I re, where we reviewed, uh, Ashley and I reviewed 32 city contracts, um, determined are they properly advertised, uh, was the low bidder awarded, and whether the contracts were properly approved. In other words, were they on the council agenda as they're supposed to be to approve? And we didn't have any discrepancies there. And then the final thing is um, I did look at that missing money website. I, I, I do that about once a year just to see if the city of Sioux Falls pops up on the missing money. And sure enough, we had we identified there's two unclaimed properties belonging to the city, so we simply uh, notified finance uh, for their staff to claim the money. So that was that was it for the uh, kind of the ongoing activities. And if you have any questions, I'd be I'll try and answer those. Mr. Martin, just one quick one uh, of the items that were on the. 2016 annual audit plan that weren't completed was it due to time or you couldn't waiting for information no no it's, it's more time and we, we we didn't have a problem with uh, getting information so nor okay thanks and I want to point out that that one uh, audit there that follow up to the fuel controls we, we got all the audit work done Ashley uh, finished all the audit work and we met with management where uh, they just need some more time to review the results so that next audit committee meeting that should be on the agenda, so, yeah. Okay, this one again needs a, um, or is... It's a report. This it's is just, a report? Yeah, it's just a report. Okay, we do not need a, or do you think we should on this one? No. Yeah, okay. Okay, 
Um, status, said the next, the last one, status. Yes, yeah, last audit. one, uh, we're required to, I think, by, by audit standards require us to do this, and I think under our audit charter we're supposed to have a process in place, and so I have a process in place to follow up. And this report kind of concentrated on the, on the 2015 audit reports, and then a, a few that were um, before 2015 that, that still had some, you know, uh, the status was, you know, hadn't been implemented. Um, the vast majority of the 2015 audit reports uh, recommendations, they've been, either been implemented or they're in progress. Um, and as far as the 2014, that, that CBB um, bid, you know, Business Improvement District, uh, that's in progress. Um, I did talk to, uh, um, you know, uh, David Bixler and uh, Council Member Rolfing, and that's, uh, we're trying to come up with a dashboard for the CBB, uh, various indicators, so that would, once that's up and running, that will satisfy that audit recommendation. Uh, the family daycare registration, that was from 2014. We had recommended that the city perform random unannounced inspections on daycares. Uh, the problem was um, management concurred. However, they said uh, they really would need to hire probably an FTE to do that, so that's kind of up to the, the council if they feel strongly about that. Um, they're the people that, the, the staff that does the inspections of, of the restaurants and so on, they pretty much have a full plate. They have a lot on their plate, and, and to add, random inspections of daycares would be probably more than they could uh, handle. So that's uh, kind of um, still, uh, still out there. Um, so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer those. Yes, Councilor Nicer. I'm curious about the public facility ticket fee. Um, all ticket, tickets issued for trade or as complimentary should be documented as such, applicable to Sioux Falls Canaries. Yeah. So two, two questions. Does that also apply to something like the Stampede, who are also under the ownership group of, like, Sioux Falls Sports? And um, w what's the thrust of why that needs to be tracked? Um, Kim, do you remember on that? I'm drawing a blank. I know Kim worked on the, did a good job on that report. And, and that one's been a while for me, too. It's been a while, um, yeah. The recommendation and the reason it says applicable to the Canaries is because they were the only group that we audited that didn't have a listing of them. Um, you know, if you want me to look back at that audit, I sure can. I think it was just a best practice. Yeah, so, so I, th I think they were the only ones that weren't doing it then. Well, right, and I mean, uh, I yeah. think at the end of the day, you want to be able yeah. to reconcile how many tickets you issued and um, because they'll do reports based on we had 2,000 people in the stands out of 3,000 seats, but if 50% of those were comp tickets, then it's not really generating revenue. And I think that was kind of the basis for it, is to track how many were actually paid tickets versus comp tickets. Yeah, I, I wondered if it was something... In their performance measures, I think, just to... In regards yeah. to that, or if, or if the comp tickets didn't have the facility fees, if those aren't recovered or and that's part of it too right you are right on that that I don't believe they pay the facility fees on those so to support our audit when we're trying to justify their numbers okay um, you know we needed that piece of information to be able to get to a, a yeah numbers. I thought maybe that was part of it, it what's kind of interesting is that I, 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 I could be wrong but I I think that we generally just you know rent the facilities out so I am not sure exactly how it works, but if they're comping tickets like crazy, I don't know whether or not that affects us or if it's more of affecting affecting them, but I, I don't know. It's it's something to be interesting to know. It doesn't have to know now, but Okay. Isn't there a isn't there a per ticket fee that we get? We get the it comes back to us. Yeah, it comes back to the city. And that's and that's what I'm yeah, that's yeah. what I'm getting at is maybe, you know, that one dollar fee for parking or whatever, if the comp tickets we don't recover that there you go. as an example, and maybe we don't. And that's why we want to know. That's and right. I will look back on that and get and follow up with you, but I believe that that is the case and part of the reasoning behind us wanting them to track those. Okay. Super. Thank you, Kim. Okay, another another one that's a report. We do not need a, a approval on that. We thank you for that report. Extensive um, and for what's going on. Move on to open discussion. Any open discussion? Seeing none um, under new business. Um, I'm asking that we uh, defer Kim's appointment um, due to some additional employment um, information that uh, we have received, and I would defer that until our next meeting. Is there a... 
Could I have mo looking for a motion? Table that till the next meeting. Okay. Second. Second by uh, Kylie. Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Um, one last thing that's, uh, that's, that needs to be said. Um, you know, Rich, you've been around here for a whole bunch of years. A whole bunch of years. Started this department and has done a great job over the last 10 years of bringing it back or bring it into um, uh, the prominence that it, that it needs. And uh, I would ask people to uh, remember Rich as he retires the 20th of this month is his last day and there will be a little reception for him here at Carnegie Hall uh, beginning at what, one o'clock? Yes. One o'clock and, and running way into the wee hours of the night uh, someplace, <laughs> right? No, three o'clock. Well, three, that's, three that's the official time, the official but time the rest time. of it's gonna go on <laughs> a lot longer. Yeah. We wish you well in your retirement. Uh, we know you'll keep busy doing some things, and uh, um, yeah, God be with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Good job. Yes. Uh, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>